As Americans gear up to celebrate Thanksgiving, a day symbolizing a friendly autumn feast between Native Americans and colonial pilgrims, we're reminded of the true plight and untold story of destruction of a culture that this country is really founded upon. To gain insight on the history and current struggle of Native peoples, I'm here in San Francisco with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, leading Indigenous scholar, activist, and author. Her latest book is titled An Indigenous People's History of the United States. We grew up learning that Columbus discovered America and that whatever society existed before that was primitive and barbaric. Talk about what Native society really looked like at that time. It was just the opposite. The whole hemisphere was actually ancient in terms of uh, cultural development and population um, migrations there, unlike the you know theory of the Bering Strait and of uh, the wandering Neolithic. Uh, that's mainly from North America, that uh, um, settler colonialism wanting to make the native disappear. Um, Columbus came first to the Caribbean, which was a, a swarm of trade routes and interchanges among all those people of the islands. And very few people know that the, of the um, seven designated areas of the beginnings of ancient agricultural civilizations, we know when we grow up, well, Tigris Euphrates River, of course. Um, that's the one we know best because supposedly that's where Europeans got culture from, a very contested area still. Uh, but we also know about China, had two, two areas of agricultural civilization development. And, uh, and, and in, um, in North Africa. But the other three were in the Americas. One was in the Andes, agricultural civilization, one central Mexico, Mesoamerica, and the other, the entire eastern half of what is now the United States. So actually they were conquering, uh, when they came to North America, they were conquering um, an area larger than and richer in agriculture than Europe at the time. So they basically annexed all these things. These civilizations, um, advanced civilizations, existed when the Europeans came and they appropriated them. In North America especially, they have a rewriting of history so that by the time later generations get there, say after the 13 colonies are formed or the United States is independent, those 13 colonies are independent, um, they see none of that because it's all been appropriated and re-changed um, for commercial agriculture. These were civilizations that were, um, were uh, expropriated and uh, the people either made into slaves, because the enslaved uh, Indians first were the first slaves to be bought and sold on the market and to work in the mines that the Spanish started. Uh, slaves were taken uh, from North America even before the English came to take into the, uh, to the mines in Mexico and Peru. With colonialism displacing people, so they had no longer had uh, their food supply, their housing, their refugees. Uh, we see refugees in the world now. They're completely dependent on institutions to take care of them. But the only institution was the colonial, um, either the Spanish or the Portuguese or the English or the French uh, and Dutch. Um, colonialists and their their desire was to weaken them, control them. Um, there were not all of these were were deaths, but that the the um, disappearance of up to ninety percent of native people as parts of a, of, of a group happened within 30 years of conquest at every stage of conquest. These people have very little defense. The Spanish um, used uh, armored horses. They grew very, very large horses for the conquest. 
Um, they were fully armored from head to toe, which made them like little tanks. The, um, the soldier was also armored from head to toe, and they had dogs uh, that they bred for the purpose of killing people. This was a fierce uh, and extremely frightening uh, um, aggressive army, not one that wanted to have diplomatic relations or trade relations, but just wanted total dominance. You can see the means of disappearance of whole groups, like the Natchez people of the Mississippi Valley, who were the people of Cahokia, the people who built this advanced civilization, farmers. The Spanish uh, raided them and Eastern Honduras and, uh, I mean, Western Honduras and Nicaragua. Those were the main slave-taking areas. So their DNA is there somewhere, but they're no longer a part of a people. You see what I mean? So it's killing the cultural cohesion and existence of a people, not just reducing um, their numbers. And that was a real intention, even when they wanted people for slaves, they wanted to destroy the cultural um, ties, the languages, the, the, um, the sovereignty and existence, the governmental structures, the, um, the autonomous, independent governmental structures. It, all the colonialisms destroyed that. I wanted to address something that you mentioned in your book, which is the feat of the fact that how many indigenous people have survived that period. I mean, just the sheer amount. What prevented native people from being completely exterminated? Was it just the inclusion in, in the slave system at that time? It's not a miracle because, of course, it was because of, of their resistance and uh, resilience and determination to survive. And I think the complexity of their cultures that they were able to, uh, unless they were all killed off or, dis or deported like the Natchez uh, to another part of the world, um, they maintained um, their ties as long as they were in their homelands. Survival is really what should be talked about rather than uh, disappearance because well, Native people are still here. The settlers and their, you know, the armed settlers had to fight for every inch of land they took from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the Gulf to the Canadian border. And that cost a lot. It cost, um, they had five regiments of six that existed out uh, the Army of the West after after the Civil War, uh, fighting uh, Plains people who were not that populous, not that that many, but were um, but had horses, you know, had taken horses from the Spanish and could defend themselves. So they couldn't defeat them. They had to make peace treaties with them, and they got very large settlements that were then whittled down politically as as they made the um, the native communities uh, completely dependent. In the case of the Plains people, they killed um, they killed all the buffalo. It was sort of a buffalo genocide of 60 million buffalo in the Plains. And they um, when they put the trains through, they as as a part of your train ticket, you got a rifle to shoot out the window. Buffalo is a big animal and not very hard to kill uh, with a rifle. So basically counterinsurgency, uh, Western counterinsurgency that came out of colonialism, it's what they call a food fight. They call it themselves the food fight where you destroy the food supply of the people, the civilians. 
and then they have to sue, you know, they, they starve or they give in. One of the things that particularly horrified me from your book, Roxanne, was that headhunting, scalp hunting was not an underground business. It was actually a lucrative economy. Uh, talk more about this. They actually um, had a ordinance that uh, allowed for the um, for bounties to be paid for heads that were brought in. They brought this directly, this practice, the British practice, in uh, the colonization of Ireland, where they had started taking heads and then scalps or other body parts. It turned out, you know, the head was just, there were so many of them. Even in Ireland, they turned to scalps. Um, they would use the heads also to terrorize people, put them along the paths and everything to terrorize people and to surrender because they'd see their families' heads <laughs> there, and they would hide the corpses so they couldn't even um, uh, get their family member back. So it was partly terror, but it was also, it became, it became a commercial market. And so no one checked very closely if, um, it was supposed to be only when there were Indian uprisings or a war. But it became the practice after a few years, just um, they could say, you know, these were warring Indians, but they could basically go in a village and just grab a bunch of children even, or elderly people and take their scalps, kill them, and sell them. Um, it was, you know, quite quite a lucrative trade for people to, you know, especially poorer people to, to um, make an income, and some people actually lived off of that income alone. You know, they were scalp hunters. So that spread, of course, with um, everywhere. You know, throughout the the colonies, and then you know, in in uh, the wars against the native people in east of the Mississippi, then west of the Mississippi, the scalp taking. So. This is a commodity, the bodies themselves, but this, this left corpses. You know, the descriptions I've read of the, the, uh, some people who were actually repelled by it, wrote in their diaries and various things, uh, letters back to England, these, these uh, bloody bodies all over, because taking the scalp, of course, it causes blood to flow all over the body. They also often, flayed the skin and used the skin of these people for various things. Uh, Jackson's army did that a lot. They used, uh, they made their rain, they were very proud of the horse reins were all made from Indian skins. So this, that kind of uh, fetishism continued uh, into the 20th century in Vietnam <laughs> where people soldiers were sending back all kinds of body parts to their relatives and all. So it's a, you know, it's just kind of built into the the military culture doing that because it was malicious, but then those are the same people then who become parts of standing armies and so forth. Um, so it was, it was pretty much a, a free enterprise, all right, of um, uh, of doing that, but there was there was also the name they gave to the the what they would use uh, referring to this bloody corpse is the term redskin, and that's why it's so repugnant to you know the ball team that calls itself that. Um, it's not just any old misuse and appropriation of of native names and symbols. It's it's uh, ghoulish, you know. So it's a uh, but most people don't know the origin of the, you know, of, of, of the word red skin. It was a description of these bloody corpses whose heads have been cut off or their scalp taken.
Wow. Um, and it's, you know, speaking of military culture, now you see native nomenclature embedded within the military establishment mm -hmm. from equipment to weapons to unit. What is the significance of this? Well, I call it a fetish, uh, you know, that it, it um, uh, built into the army, which in the United States has uh, only rarely been used for any, any purpose except uh, conquest. Even the Civil War, not to take the side of the Confederacy, but they pretty much used the same methods, you know, of um, scorched earth and food fight and so forth against the southern, I mean, they were fighting on southern territory. Uh, but only in World War I, World War II, did you have late coming Americans fight, uh, let's say, a, uh, standard what you think of as war and that's why those wars are tooted so much and others kind of put aside. There has to be some kind of um, uh, dehumanization involved. Uh, most recently and it's not so recent anymore to people because you know those of us uh, who were adults uh, or students anyway in the 60s uh, saw these things happening on television and those of us who knew this history said, this rings a bell, you know, and also their use of the term Indian country for enemy territory. Almost every generation has to have a regeneration through violence in order to justify its actions, you know, by doing it again. And it does seem that way. <laughs> and then not to speak of the civilians who take it in their own hands, no more malicious, so they just go out and shoot up a bunch of people. So there's, there's, there are these hanging threads of colonialism that are very troublesome, you know, in the culture that people think, you know, banning guns or doing this or that uh, without really considering what's, you know, what, what's the historical kind of psychological, um, what's at work there? Before, when you were speaking about genocide and um, you know, how the term encompasses the institutionalized attempt to destroy a culture, a heritage, an entire peoples, I wanted you to just quickly address the re-education camps because I don't think a lot of people really know that that happened and how many people were integrated in this dehumanizing process. His name was Pratt, uh, General Pratt. He said, let's um, teach them English and cut. So he has their hair cut off puts them in army uniform, drills them all the time, and then starts, gets some of the teachers from the colony there, the, the, uh, um, the, the um, settlement, uh, civilian settlement there. Some of the teachers to come in and teach them English and some of, the, you know, others to encourage their artwork. And then he starts, uh, they get so um, adjusted, you know, they're completely separated from their families and all. And they're told that they can be better off, you know, than being these savages that they were. And um, so they're, it's just kind of a brainwashing. He thinks this experiment works pretty well and he, Builds it up into a report uh, to the uh, Department of War, which is what it was called at the time, uh, to have this be more routine practice, to take the children away. Um, he says it's hard with the adults. Some of them backslide, you know, and try to escape, and there's a rebel among them, but take them as children and put them far away from their families, cut their hair and make them into, you know, as, and his motto was to um, kill the Indian um, and save the man. So that was, you know, to kill the Indian, that person, so they could just be an individual. Christianizing, Christianizing came along with it. So they set up these boarding, federal boarding schools and then it became mandatory all Native families had to bring their children in to be taken to. And so this whole network of boarding schools were set up. And they, if you didn't turn the children in, uh, the army, army, uh, an army unit would come out and um, either 
take one of the people, usually the father of the family, away, imprison him until, you know, they said where they're hiding the kids. And somewhere there were some interesting stories of, of some families that were able to hide out uh, some of the young people and hide them in caves and take food to them, you know, and, and uh, uh, they didn't learn English, so they, they became the transmitters of the culture because they realized what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, they took them away at five years old, and they couldn't return until 16. So they missed all of the elements of, you know, their cultural learning. So this was generations, you know, from the 1870s until the 1960s, a uh, hundred years of that. So there's still living people who, who went through that kind of, it was, you know, with the rise of the Native movement in the 1960s, um, at least by 1972, uh, the Indian Self-Determination Act that was went through, uh, it uh, took away the mandatory uh, requirement for the boarding schools. What aspects of capitalism are still encroaching on Native peoples today? Uh, Native peoples land is mainly um, uh, mining and oil extraction. It's been for a while since um, since post-World War II when they identified, you know, uranium exists everywhere, but they made it seem like, and I, I remember this, that it was a rare substance found only in certain places that happened to be on Indian land mm -hmm. in Nevada and northern, uh, in New Mexico and in the state of Washington. Interesting, you know, and <laughs> these were the only places with uranium, but... Uh, so they just devastated those lands, you know, with open pit uranium mines. The densest part of Indian land is New Mexico and uh, and into northern Arizona. Um, and they are, you know, just under the um, boot of um, uh, resource extraction. Mm -hmm. And the pipelines, of course, are a big issue now where they're trying to cross native land and getting a lot of resistance from Native people. And thousands of people recently came out to support Native-led struggle in New Mexico to have Columbus Day ended as a holiday, and they won. Um, from Keystone XL, which is what you're talking about, to change the name movement. Where's the struggle today, and how can we build solidarity with the movement of resistance? The I Don't Know More in the fall of uh, 2011 and Christmas time, 2011, um, just followed on, you know, followed right on the Occupy movement. I think is sort of the Indians got the ideas, sort of like when they, when they, um, civil rights movement uh, doing sit-ins, sit-ins at restaurants and all, Native people thought, sit-in, how can we apply that? So they took over Alcatraz. They sat in at Alcatraz. They took over land, you know, different land bases around. But they got the idea from the sit-ins, you know, so these things kind of interact with each other. The Native movement is, uh, yeah, this year the, they've been working for years, you know, ever since we started going to the United Nations, you know, in 1977, demanding that uh, Columbus Day be not be a national holiday and that there be a day of mourning on October 12th every year for um, the um, uh, for the onset of colonialism that Columbus and genocide that Columbus represents as the initial act. And only Berkeley went for it, you know, like <laughs> in the 1980s, uh, Berkeley became uh, declared Indigenous Peoples Day. Every year it happens, but this year, suddenly there was a shift and city councils and like, Towns in Oklahoma and, of course, Albuquerque, these real colonial places, you know, were actually um, declaring the holiday of Washington State and Seattle and Portland. And um, so it's, it's uh, I think it was a real boost, you know. It's a small thing. It's a symbolic thing. Uh, the mascotry uh, movement is really important, not just the Redskins, but uh, there are Redskin, uh, something like 300 high schools in the United States have uh, Redskins as their, as their name. So there's 
much local work that's done in these different places. You realize that it's not just about football or about the sport or about just hanging on to a name. It really is about keeping that history intact, you know, of domination.